This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, the War and Peace Report, as we turn now to Ukraine, where thousands of anti-government demonstrators have constructed what amounts to a self-sufficient protest city within the capital, Kiev. The standoff prompted the country's prime minister to resign on Tuesday. Its parliament has agreed to repeal a round of laws that crack down on dissent. On Wednesday, lawmakers offered an amnesty to protesters who've been arrested during the standoff, but only on the condition that activists vacate buildings they've occupied in Kiev and other parts of Ukraine. This is the Speaker of the Parliament, Volodymyr Rybak. Let me remind you that yesterday we have approved the bill number 4007 about the law of Ukraine that ceased to be in force. We have also agreed to discuss today the questions related to the removal of the negative consequences in non-admission pursuit and punishment of persons in relation to the events which took place during peaceful rallies. So, I come up with a proposition to vote on legislation without discussion. I ask people's deputies to vote. The government's amnesty offer was an attempt to get people to remove their barricades and tents from the main protest zone in Kiev, but so far demonstrators have vowed to continue their occupation. If the authorities had shown honesty according to the mandate they were given, we would trust them. But now they have compromised the guarantees. We have no trust in these authorities. We have doubts in their honesty and decency, and that's why it's risky. And so we are not leaving, that's for sure. People came here so that all of them would be gone, so that the president would be gone and the government would be gone. We need full change. We cannot go on like this. The demonstrations in Ukraine are collectively referred to as Euronidin. They began in late November, after President Viktor Yanukovych reversed his decision to sign a long-awaited trade deal with the European Union in a move that favored stronger ties with Russia instead. The protests rapidly grew in size after a violent police crackdown. While nationalists led the demonstrations, at first, others have since joined the movement. At least five protesters have been killed in clashes with police. Hundreds have been injured. Police have also attacked dozens of journalists, destroyed their equipment. As tensions continued to increase on Wednesday, Ukraine's first post-independence president, Leonid Kravchuk, emphasized the seriousness of the crisis. The situation is, frankly, very dramatic. All the world acknowledges, and Ukraine acknowledges, that the state is on the brink of civil war. There are parallel authorities in the country, and there is a de facto uprising. When the power is taken over, which is a real fact, when the power is falling down and the constitutional authorities refuse to honor their responsibilities, it becomes clear that this is a fall of the power. This is simply a revolution. For more, we're joined by two guests. Here in New York, Stephen Cohen who is, is with us, Professor Emeritus of Russian Studies and Politics at New York University and Princeton University. His most recent book, Soviet Fates and Lost Alternatives from Stalinism to the New Cold War, is now out in paperback. He recently wrote a letter to The New York Times that was critical of its editorial on Ukraine and Russian President Vladimir Putin's role in the country. Joining us from London, Anton Shakhatsov, a Ukrainian citizen who just got back early this month from observing the protests in Kiev. He's a researcher at the University College London, specializing in studying the far right. He recently wrote a piece titled, What the West Should Know About the Uranidin's Far Right Element. Anton Shakotsov, uh, Stephen Cohen, welcome both to Democracy Now! Let's begin with Anton in London. What should people understand? Well, first of all, thank you for the invitation to Democracy Now! Uh, I wrote the piece to highlight uh, a very dangerous trend, in my opinion, is that uh, many people in the West buy into pro Russian propaganda, which is saying that uh, Euromaidan is infiltrated by the neo-Nazis and anti-Semites. And this is uh, completely untrue. There is a far-right element in, in Euromaidan protests, but it is a, a minor element. And uh, the Euromaidan protest is, is 
basically a multicultural democratic movement uh, which is trying to to build a new Ukraine, a democratic Ukraine. Um, and sometimes, by the name far right, there goes Ukrainian nationalism. And Ukrainian nationalism has uh, its main thrust is a uh, building of, of a truly independent Ukraine, a Ukraine which would be a national democratic state and not a colony of Russia, as Ukrainian nationalists think uh, Ukraine is. So the move towards Europe is a move towards democracy and away from the authoritarianism of Russia and its projected Eurasian Union, which w would uh, unite and unite uh, several authoritarian states like Belarus, Kazakhstan and Russia. So Ukrainians do not want this. They want to be away from authoritarianism and they, they struggle for democracy now in Ukraine. So basically, uh, Ukraine is now a front line of, of democratic Europe. And they are not, Ukrainians are not only fighting for their own freedom, but they are, fight, uh, they are fighting to stop authoritarianism to spread westwards. Stephen Cohen, what is your take on what's happening in Ukraine right now? Well, it's not what Anton said. Um, where to begin? Can we begin at the beginning? What's happening in Ukraine, what's been unfolding since November in the streets, is probably the single most important international story underway today. It may impact for a very long time the geopolitics of Europe, Russia, American-Russian relations, and a lot more. At the same time, uh, media coverage of this story, particularly in the United States, has been exceedingly misleading, very close to what Anton just told you. I would characterize Anton's characterization, to be as polite as I can, as half-true. But a half-truth is an untruth. The realities are there is no the Ukraine. All this talk about Ukraine is on the front line of democracy. There are at least two Ukraines. One tilts toward Poland and Lithuania, the West, the European Union. The other told toward Russia. This is not my notion. This is what every public opinion poll has told us since this crisis unfolded, that about 40 percent of Ukrainians want to go West. 40% uh, want to stay with Russia, and it's usually true in these polls, 20% just don't know, or they're not sure. Uh, who precipitated this crisis? It was the European Union, in this sense. It gave the Ukrainian government, which, by the way, is a democratically elected government, if you overthrow this government, just like they overthrew Morsi in Egypt, you're dealing a serious blow to democracy. So if the crowd manages to essentially carry out a coup d'etat from the streets, that's what democracy is not about. But here's what the European Union did back in November. It told the government of Ukraine, if you want to sign an economic relationship with us, you cannot sign one with Russia. Why not? Putin said, why don't the three of us have an arrangement? We'll help Ukraine. The West will help Ukraine. The Chancellor of Germany, Merkel, at first thought that was a good idea. But she backed down for various political reasons. So essentially, Ukraine was giving an ultimatum. Sign the EU economic agreement or else. Now, what was that agreement? It would have been an economic catastrophe for Ukraine. I'm not talking about the intellectuals or the people who are well-placed. About ordinary Ukrainians, the Ukrainian economy is on the brink of a meltdown. It needed billions of dollars. What did the European Union offer them? The same austerity policies that are ravaging Europe, and nothing more, $600 million. It needed billions and billions. There's one other thing. If you read the protocols of the European offer to Ukraine, which has been interpreted in the West as just about civilizational change, escaping Russia, economics, democracy, there is a big clause on military cooperation. In effect, by signing this, Ukraine would have had to abide by NATO's military policies. What would that mean? That would mean drawing a new Cold War line, which used to be in Berlin, right through the heart of Slavic civilization on Russia's borders. So that's where we're at to now. One other point. These right-wing people, whom Anton thinks are not significant, all reports 
And I don't know when he was in Ukraine. Maybe he was long ago and things had developed. But the reports that are coming out of Ukraine are the following. One, the moderates, that's the former heavyweight champion boxer of Vitaly Klitschko and others, have lost control of the street. They've asked the people who have been attacking the police with Molotov cocktails and to vacate the buildings they've occupied to stop. And the street will not stop, partly because, I'd say largely because, the street in Kiev is now controlled by these right-wing extremists. And that, that extremism has spread to western Ukraine where these people are occupying government buildings. So in fact, you have a political civil war underway. What is the face of these people? this right wing. A, they hate Europe as much as they hate Russia. Their official statement is, Europe is homosexuals, Jews, and the decay of the Ukrainian state. They want nothing to do with Europe. They want nothing to do with Russia. I'm talking about this. It's not a fringe, but this very right wing thing. What does their political activity include? It includes writing on buildings in western Ukraine, Jews live here. That's exactly what the Nazis wrote on the homes of Jews when they occupied Ukraine. Uh, a priest who represents part of the political movement in western Ukraine, Putin quoted this, but it doesn't make it false. It doesn't make it false. It's been verified. A West Euro Ukrainian priest said, we, Ukraine, will not be governed by Negroes, Jews, or Russians. So these people have now come to the fore. The first victims of any revolution, I don't know if this is a revolution, but the first victims of any revolution are the moderates. And the moderates have lost control of what they created, helped by the European Union and the American government back in November. And so now anything is possible, including two Ukraines. Anton Shekhovsov, can you respond to Professor Stephen Cohen? Yes, so this is basically what I said as a as a called as a distortion in the Western media. I don't know if Professor Cohen have been in Ukraine. I've been to Ukraine just a few days ago. I haven't seen that the right wingers have taken control of the streets. Uh, the streets are controlled by uh, Euromaidan, which is ideologically very uh, different. There is a right-wing element, but this is the element which is only a minor component of Euromaidan. And if you remember the solidarity movement in the 80s in Poland, it also comprised some right-wing elements. But in the end, they built a democratic national, national democratic Poland. Uh, as for the neo-Nazis and uh, anti-Semites in Western, in Western Ukraine, there are some. But at the same time, if you talk to them, if you interview them, and if you read their demands, you will not find any discrimination laws among their demands. What they demand is the national democratic state, independent from Russia. Even if they say that they are against uh, the European Union, they at the same time support the pro-European protests. And this is partly what Euromaidan is about. Uh, and then again, there are many false reports about the beatings of uh, representatives of national minorities in Ukraine. And mostly these reports are all false. They are being spread by uh, Russia back, Russian backed uh, propagandists like Viktor Medvedchuk, leader of the pro-Eurasian, pro-Russian party, Ukrainsky Vibor, Ukrainian choice. So these people, they are trying to uh, distort the image of Euromaidan and picture it as a, something very violent, as something very right-wing, although the right-wing element, as I said, is a minor element at Euromaidan. Uh, Professor Richard Cohen. Steven. Professor Stephen Cohen. Richard Cohen writes for the Washington Post. We are completely different people. But he's people. not a professor, so. Well, we're still different people. <laughs> Stephen. Yeah, thank you. Can you respond to what he's saying and also talk about um, how people are informed here, largely through the media, the media coverage of what's happening in Ukraine? I've already responded to what Anton has said. To me, it's a fundamental misrepresentation, and it raises questions in my mind, though he's entitled to his political allegiances who he represents in Ukraine. He's clear where he stands. But even the American media, 
which deleted this right-wing element for two months, now has gotten worried about it. There's an article in Time magazine, I think the day before yesterday, I think, because I saw it on the internet, but today's New York Times, January 30th, New York Times editorial, is now worried about these people. So Antoine's not worried about them for his own reasons. But the plain reality is that the so-called moderates, who are democratic, have lost control of the situation. And here's the evidence. The moderate leaders, including Klitschko, the boxer who wants to be president of Ukraine, entered into a negotiation with Yanukovych, the democratically elected president of Ukraine. And what did he offer them? He offered them a coalition government which is a traditional democratic solution to such a crisis. He said, we will give Klitschko and the other Ukrainian democratic leader the prime ministership and the deputy prime ministership. That's a colossal concession. It's power sharing. That's what you do in a crisis. They didn't accept. Now, they didn't accept for ser the several reasons. The protesters didn't accept. No, wait a minute. Klitschko and the other democratic leader didn't accept. One reason, the main reason, is the street wouldn't accept it. And since both of these guys want to be president when there's elections in 215, if there are elections, uh, they're not going to go against the street. They become captives of the street. Now, the street, increasingly, is in the control of these right-wingers. Let me make a point, and it'd be interesting to hear what Anton thinks about this. Many young thugs in the street are trying to kill policemen. They're throwing Molotov cocktails at them. They're beating them up. Now, the police are brutal also. But name me one democratic country that would allow mobs to attack policemen in the street of a, uh, of a capital city and not crack down. And in fact, the Ukrainian police haven't cracked down. Uh, Anton Chekhovsov, your response. Well, the police has already cracked down on the protesters. At the end of November, when peaceful protesters were brutally beaten by the riot police, they did not do anything except for staying on the Independence Square in Kiev, and they were beaten up, and some people have disappeared. And since then, since the end of November, there are tens of dozens of people who, are, who have been kidnapped by the police, and now uh, they are found sometimes frozen to death with their hands uh, tied at their backs. So there is a, there is a whole campaign of state terror uh, going on in Ukraine. And uh, more than five pe people were killed already. And uh, uh, Arseniy Yutsenyuk, one of the uh, uh, whom one of the politicians whom Professor Cohen uh, called uh, the moderates, he was uh, offered a position of prime minister. But Ukraine is a presidential republic, so the whole power, the whole political power is in the hands of uh, President Viktor Yanukovych. So this position is not really powerful. Uh, prime minister does not have any influence on politics and on the way Ukraine develops. Amy, so it Stephen wasn't Cohen. really a concession. Yeah. Anton, Anton may have been in Ukraine a week ago, but he's completely out of touch. Part of the deal that Yanukovych offered the moderates was to change the constitution to deprive the president of the power he now has and switch this it to the prime untrue. minister. This is completely untrue. This is simply untrue. Well, it's, it's not untrue. I mean, I've read the documents. I read the speech. It hasn't gone through. It's still at the parliament. They may vote on it. They may not. But you're simply not representing the situation correctly. Well, I am representing the situation correctly, because I've been there. I've seen all the documents that were being discussed in the parliament. And President Yanukovych never offered to go back to the constitution of 2004, which would reintroduce the parliamentary republic. Uh, he wants all the power he, he's got uh, during th three years of his, of his rule. He has now control of all the oligarchic business in Ukraine. He's trying to build, he was trying to build a whole business empire and uh, give his family and the oligarchs and businessmen connected to the family uh, all the economic power in Ukraine. So, of course, he's now will be fighting till death, because if he loses, his family is losing, uh, will lose all the money that they've stolen from Ukrainian people and invested it 
it in uh, European banks invested it in European businesses as well as American businesses as well. I want to I want to get Stephen Cohen's response to last month's senators John McCain and Christopher Murphy uh, visiting the protesters at their hub in Kiev's Independence Square and voicing support for their cause. We are here to tell you that the American people and the United States Congress stands with the people of Ukraine. I am a Republican. Senator Murphy is a Democrat. We are here together speaking for the American people in solidarity with you. Professor Stephen Cohen. Well, that's Anton's position. I mean, Anton represents, uh, at least his description of the situation, the mainstream American media political view of what's going on in Ukraine. And when I say mainstream, I mean it extends from the right wing in America to MSNBC, to the so-called liberals and progressives, to Bill Mars, who did this on his show the other night. There's no alternative voice in America except what I'm trying to say to you today. Uh, it's wrong. It's wrong uh, factually. Uh, it's wrong in terms of policy. For McCain to go, as he's done in other countries, he once said we're all Georgians, now he's saying we're all Ukrainians. Uh, if he understands the situation in Ukraine, and he may not, uh, then he's being reckless. But a true understanding of Ukraine begins with the fact that there are at least two Ukraines, two legitimate Ukraines, culturally, politically, ethnically, economically, culturally. This isn't Putin's fault. This isn't Yanukovych, the president of Ukraine's fault. It's either God's fault or it's history's fault. This is what came down through the centuries. This situation has been explosive since the end of the Soviet Union 22 years ago. When Western politicians go there, they're playing with fire, metaphorically. And now they have real fire. You think fire. this is about the media's vilification of Putin? I think that the vilification of Putin in this country, demonization, is the worst press coverage by the American media of Russia that I've seen in my 40 years of studying Russia and contributing to the media. It's simply almost insane. This idea that he's a thug and that explains everything passes for analysis we in America today. We have to leave today. it there. I want to thank you very much, Stephen Cohen, as well as Anton Shekhovsov, for joining us uh, to talk about Ukraine. We'll continue to follow.